map chance. Hi, everyone, and welcome. I'm Maggie McCullough, President of Policy Map, and again, welcome to Map Chats. Our webinar today is on land banks um, and how two very innovative land banks have used data to both shape their strategies and implement their programs. For those of you who are signing on to Map Chats for the first time, uh, Policy Map, the organization that's behind this webinar series, is a national online mapping service that provides maps and data vis visualization tools for tens of thousands of indicators related to housing, health, demographics, and more. Map Chats is a free webinar series, which we just started this year, in order to create a place for people to share their stories and learn how others are using data and maps in their work. Map Chats features experts from a variety of topics, including housing policy, healthy food access, creative placemaking, and now with today's call, uh, land banks. Our speakers discuss how their work incorporates geographic data and maps and gives each of you, our audience, a chance to see firsthand the invaluable role that maps and data can really play in the everyday work of both policymakers and practitioners. Um, before we get started, I just want to introduce a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, note that this is a webinar format, and so everyone right now is muted. Uh, but if you have any questions, and obviously we hope that you do, uh, we'd like you to type them into the GoToWebinar panel. Uh, at any time, just type in your question into that panel, and we will answer you during the Q&A um, at the end of the presentations. We'll also be recording this map chat, and we'll post it to our YouTube channel and blog. So what I'd like to do first is introduce our two speakers, Robert Lynn and Michael Schramm. Thank you both. Um, and then I'm going to turn it over first to Robert and then to Michael. As I mentioned previously, we're going to save the questions um, to the Q&A session at the end. Um, and then if there are any questions which we are unable to get to uh, during the webinar, we will reach out to you after uh, with answers to your questions. Um, so for those of you really that have been wondering what a land bank is, I just wanted to start by saying that it is defined as a government or community owned entity that acquires, manages, maintains, and repurposes vacant, abandoned, and foreclosed properties. Um, according to one estimate, there are now approximately 120 land banks and land banking programs across the country. So, Robert, we'd like to start with you. Um, by way of introduction, Robert is the Senior Data Manager at the Detroit Land Bank Authority. Uh, Robert manages an inventory of over 80,000 parcels while overseeing the development of land use policy and the use of data streams to create more granular and proactive responses to the city's vacant properties. And Robert, it's all yours. Oh. Thank you so much for <clears throat> having me, Maggie. Greetings from uh, Detroit. I'm uh, Rob Lynn, a senior data manager at the Detroit Land Bank Authority, as you said. Uh, founded in 2010, the DLBA is among the minority of land banks across the country that operate at the scale of a city rather than a county or regional jurisdiction. Like most of our peers, the Detroit Land Bank serves to return tax reverted and blighted properties to productive reuse and improve quality of life in the city's neighborhoods. It's a big honor to be joining Mike here since we look to them as the experts on so many of these issues. Today, the DLBA is the largest land bank in, an, in the nation with a growing inventory of nearly 80,000 parcels. My role at the land bank is that of inventory manager. I'm working to address titles of issue of title, delinquent taxes, and blight among our property holdings using large-scale data streams from a multifarious set of sources to triage our properties into appropriate programs and move them towards ultimate sale and reuse. The fundamental issue we run into is that our inventory is too large to handle most issues on a property-by-property -property basis. So much of our work, from ordering demolition activities to clearing delinquent taxes, occurs through bulk work. Along these lines, our need for property investment exceeds our available resources, and so we do a great deal of work and modeling to better target our work based upon neighborhood and property conditions. 
the story of land use and real estate in Detroit is inextricably tied to population loss. In 1950, the city's population topped 1.8 million and today has declined to roughly 700,000. Unfortunately, however, as people migrated out of Detroit, they didn't take their houses with them. And so Detroit is left with an overabundance of substandard housing with rock bottom values. Though the city's population is stabilizing, the latest estimates from the Census Bureau indicate that the city still has nearly 100,000 vacant housing units across its 139 square miles. The research consensus on these issues is that, in aggregate, vacant and abandoned homes can depress surrounding property values, increase crime, spur population loss, disincentivize property investment, and even affect the transportation mode split, among other impacts. Furthermore, many researchers have documented that blight is a contagion, and so it is both a cause and effect of neighborhood instability. Through a long-standing problem in Detroit, the issue came to the fore in Detroit during the city's 2013 a municipal bankruptcy process when the scope of blight issues was a key issue in the city's bankruptcy. In this context, the White House convened a blight removal task force in the fall of 2013 after a relatively thorough hunting and gathering phase to compile research and experience-based vantage points on the issue. The task force established a set of recommendations to guide the city's approach to blight remediation over the long term. These recommendations were thoughtful and diverse, including the development of a centralized Department of Neighborhoods to serve as the point of contact for all property-related issues, to develop an open data portal to facilitate the transparent tracking of progress, and a tipping point neighborhood strategy that puts emphasis on those neighborhoods at the greatest risk of further disinvestment. I'll touch on a number of recommendations throughout the rest of this slide deck. That said, however, two of those recommendations have had the biggest impact on the local blight fight. The first was the development of a citywide windshield survey of parcels called Motor City Mapping, which has been an incredibly useful asset underlying all of our work. The other key recommendation was the significant retooling and dramatic expansion of the Detroit Land Bank Authority, for which I now work. As one of two especially prominent recommendations for the Blight Task Force, the Motor City Mapping Project set out to produce a baseline survey of all 380,000 parcels of property in the city and to develop a platform that would allow for continual updates by residents, neighborhood groups, and city workers. One of the nagging challenges facing all previous efforts to eradicate blight in the city has been a complete lack of data to track and target cleanup efforts. To remedy this, the task force implemented a citywide survey. The initial survey consisted of 75 survey teams that worked from mid-December 2013 through January 2014. The survey used Nokia 7 tablets to blast think text, uh, photos and tabular data about each property well on foot or from their cars. Using an app developed by local tech company Loveland Technologies, the surveyors captured data on a total of 11 variables. In addition to tracking whether each property was a structure or lot, the survey captured data spe specific to lots and structures. For structures, surveyors noted the use, condition, number of units, whether a property was fire damaged, and whether the property was open to trespass. For lots, the survey tracked whether there was illegal dumping, whether the property was open to trespass, and uh, whether there were improvements, and finally whether there was a discernible public use. By the spring of 2014, the Blight Task Force had published a full data set with corollary spatial objects. <clears throat> the central database was built with Ruby and includes a full interactive parcel level map. You can check it out at www.motorcitymapping.com. This rich, granular look at property conditions in the city has afforded us an incredible foundation for all other data analysis efforts. Longer term, the project also established the Blexting app for mobile phones. Residents, neighborhood associations, civic orgs, and city workers can Blext updates as properties change. Before these updates occur to the cloud-based 
central database professional surveyors quality control each flex to, to ensure that the photo is of the right property and that the tabular data is an accurate depiction of the photo. Beyond the baseline survey data, the task force also developed an analysis of neighborhoods and of properties using the survey data and a number of ancillary data sets. The task force's central, most noteworthy findings were around the scale of the blight in the city. Using Motor City mapping alongside 16 other data sets, local nonprofit data consultancy, Data Driven Detroit came up with an index to identify blighted properties in the city. In total, Data Driven Detroit looked at a range of indicators, including tax and mortgage foreclosures, public property ownership, dangerous building complaints fire insurance claims, previous property surveys and assessment data, among other data sets. In the end, their findings were staggering. They exceeded all expectations. The task force found that there were 84,641 structures um, that were in need of anti-blight intervention, including 40,077 structures that were clearly blighted and 38,000 structures that had some indications of blight. The other key recommendation from the Blight Task Force was for the city to revivify the Detroit Land Bank Authority. When the land bank was initially established in 2010, it served as a small-scale vehicle for the city to complete home rehabs as part of the federal neighborhood stabilization program. The authority had five staff and several hundred properties. That rapidly changed once the Blight Task Force report came out and the Detroit Land Bank Authority grew rapidly to address many of the recommendations. Ultimately, the Detroit Land Bank grew three programmatic pillars, disposition, demolition, and nuisance abatement. Our data team of five analysts operate and continually update our centralized property management platform. The team serves as the connective tissue and coordinating body between all three program teams. This is a screen grab of our website www.buildingdetroit.org, where we host daily auctions, sell fully rehabbed homes, sell raw, unrehabbed homes at a fixed price, and sell side lots. Our most well-known disposition program, our daily auction of three homes, is based entirely online, where we sell properties in the city's strongest neighborhoods for buyers to rehab. We use hundreds of available data sets to filter our inventory and ensure that properties get into the appropriate demolition or disposition pipeline as soon as possible. Although many of our programs are restricted to particular target areas, some combination of our programs operate in every neighborhood across the city depending on the funding available and the most targeted intervention for each neighborhood. In total, the DLBA owns approximately 80,000 parcels, has 80 staff, demolishes 4,000 homes a year and commences nuisance abatement hearings against 1,000 properties and sells several thousand properties a year. At any given time, we have approximately 25,000 side lots listed for sale and available to residents. The fundamental challenge the DLBA faces is the inability to tackle the entirety of the vacant property issue at once, and so we consequently need to target our efforts where we believe they'll have the largest impact. All of our efforts look to stabilize populations and real estate markets, and so we use a full suite of real estate data to target our work and establish programmatic boundaries. We most frequently look to real estate values, population change, mortgage originations, land assembly potential, and real estate market volumes, building permits, and home fires when we assess neighborhoods to target our efforts. One of the land bank's primary roles is to serve as the owner of last resort for foreclosed, blighted, and vacant homes in the city. By the end of January, we expect to hold title to more than 100,000 properties, or more than one in four properties in the city. To the best of our knowledge, we're the largest landowner in, in the nation as measured by the number of parcels. Historically, one of the chief challenges to dealing with tax rooted properties in Detroit was the fact that public ownership was so dispersed as many as 20 public agencies from the public school district to the water department held surplus vacant property. One of our chief projects to date has been to transfer all of those properties to the land bank to establish a simple 
centralized resource for assembling and selling publicly owned properties. While most of our properties have come from other public agencies, we also actively gather property from the state of Michigan, unsold tax foreclosures from the Wayne County Treasurer, vacant bank-owned properties, donations from private citizens, as well as default judgments from owners of nuisance abatement properties through our nuisance abatement program. Land banking is a, is a really tricky business. Uh, between our inventory and programmatic activities, we track thousands of variables about our properties, our nuisance abatement defendants, our property purchasers, properties held by other public agencies, and properties undergoing demolition. To track and coordinate all of our activities, we use a heavily, heavily modified instance of Salesforce. I'm sure most folks know Salesforce as the customer relationship management or a so-called CRM platform, but fundamentally what we found is that it is a highly adaptable cloud-based relational database. A team of pros from enterprise communities and our own gifted Salesforce admin have developed a versatile, robust platform. Our uh, Salesforce system went live in April 2015. One of the simplest but most game-changing differences between Salesforce and most of the other inventory tracking systems I've seen is that in Salesforce, we're tracking hundreds of data points about the geographic, physical, and financial condition of every status um, and property in the city. Consequently, when we add a property to our inventory, it is simply a matter of flipping a switch. More importantly, more importantly, we'll already have a pretty extensive background profile on the property, allowing us to more rapidly conduct triage on the property. Salesforce is a cloud-based system, so we're also able to integrate with other platforms pretty simply. We're a few days out from integrating with the city's new Socrata open data portal so residents can track our actions and take data polls to do their own analysis of our work. Longer term, we're looking to develop API connectivity to other government platforms, including the Register of Deeds, the city's uh, assessment platform, the building department's building permit system, as well as our own sales sites. So changes in Salesforce can automatically migrate across city platforms, and the Salesforce system will be more robust, allowing our staff to see a more recent, richer look into properties. At any given time, we have staff working on a litany of activities, from tracking soil-based contamination to clearing delinquent taxes, scheduling lawn mowing to arranging interior structural inspections or reporting title search results, negotiating donation agreements, etc. At any time, staff are simultaneously entering data and working on every facet of a property. To overcome this potential train wreck of simultaneous activity, our Salesforce platform uses distinct record types and a series of automated workflows to avoid conflicting activities and mandate staff follow-up when necessary. The central record type in Salesforce is the property with a steep hierarchy of subordinate record types below that. Below the property, we have major programmatic records called cases that include a great deal of summary data and history of the land bank's work with the property. Below this, we have activities, the sort of component actions that support a more major action. These activities are like board ups, title searches, auction open houses, demolition inspections, and quiet title actions. In turn, these uh, activity records have their own subordinate records to track even more granular actions, such as invoice approvals and resident complaints. Through automated workflows built into the relational database, any action at one level of the property will dynamically update all records beneath it or above it. This tree diagram really only reveals the first two layers of the onion, but there are many more. This model also allows us to implement rigorous conflict detection, and so staff can't schedule demolition if we have a pending open house, for example. We're also keeping close tabs in the city. We do this both to measure the impact of our work and to maintain an ongoing reassessment of the city to ensure that every neighborhood is receiving the appropriate market interventions. 
in a, a city with a long history of population loss, one indicator we look to fairly frequently is population migration and especially newly occupied homes. This map was made with address level vacancy data from the United States Postal Service through a geocoding service called Semaphore. Uh, like the signal flags, uh, the land bank can tap into the post office's vast wealth of vacancy data. As mail carriers complete their routes, they track which houses are vacant and which are occupied to help inform their own mail forwarding system. Though a lagging indicator of vacancy, this is among the more rapid indicators of housing vacancy we have. Another common metric we examine is market valuation. We strive to align our most intensive interventions in areas with the healthiest real estate markets. And so monthly polls of multiple listing service data allow us to closely monitor market trajectories and establish benchmarks. For data sources like the MLS listings and sales data, we're constantly working to refine our tools for accessing these data. We've begun developing Python tools to automatically convert the archaic formats of their standardized reports into map and analysis-ready formats. We can, of course, extract other data from the MLS reports to assess market health, such as days on market averages or comparative market volumes to better understand our neighborhoods. Gathering historic MLS data also allows us to gain a richer profile uh, into our uh, current and future inventory. The MLS holds a great deal of data about listings, such as bedroom counts, foundation types, porch types, and roofing material. Since neighborhoods change so quickly and our inventory is so expansive, we often struggle to create accurate forecasts for our long-term resource needs. One of the most nifty tools we have is a citywide demolition probability analysis. Drawing upon a diverse slate of 49 administrative data sets, including building permits, blight complaints, motor city mapping condition data, and sales history, our team developed a logistic regression function by which we can predict the probability that a future hypothetical structural inspection will find that the property needs to be demolished at the 95% confidence interval. This allows us to predict future needs given our current and future inventory. Detroit's neighborhoods are changing in every way at such a breakneck pace that it can be difficult to accurately understand the up to the minute condition and tra trajectory of neighborhoods. There's a notion in quantum mechanics that we can't see where a particle is only where it has been, since at the rate particles are moving, they've moved by the time we've completed our observation. I think the same holds true for neighborhoods in some ways. Neighborhood metrics change rapidly, and just about all of our data are lagging indicators and give us a lens into what the neighborhood looked like one month, one quarter, or one year ago. These types of statistical analyses help us get out in front of these issues and can help us shift from reactive work to proactive, if not preventative work. Ultimately, the best way to handle blight is to, to prevent it from happening. Since most of our data is administrative data from local government partners, we constantly struggle to glean concrete information from incomplete, inconsistent, and contradictory data. One struggle we've had is to uh, gain a nuanced understanding of occupancy since any single metric available to us is rather flawed. For example, our Motor City mapping occupancy data tends to give us false positives for occupancy when neighbors maintain vacant homes nearby. Along the same lines, our utility data gives us false negatives for occupancy when residents obtain illegal power hookups. To get around this issue, we've expanded on a powerful tool developed for us by our wonderful partners at Data Driven Detroit. We've created a vacancy index drawing on five data sets, gas, water accounts, water service, postal delivery, motor city mapping, and the Velasquez shopping news to construct a 10-point index, giving us a more nuanced look into property occupancy. We found that aggregating the tricky a municipal data set allows us to get around some of the shortcomings and limitations of the individual files. The whole is truly greater than the sum of its parts. 
that's it. If you uh, want to follow up with me about anything I've said, shoot me an email or give me a call. There are a few things I love more than talking about a cadastral data. My uh, communications team would uh, have my hide if I don't make one final plug. If you want to uh, follow some of our further forthcoming future analysis uh, efforts, uh, follow the Land Bank on uh, Facebook and Twitter at the links on this uh, slide. Robert, thank you. Um, we have had a number of questions come in while you were speaking. Um, and as I mentioned at the beginning, we're going to wait to the end and take them all then. Mm -hmm. But there are some great questions in the queue already. Um, and thank you. I am absolutely blown away by the fact that you are soon going to own one out of every four properties, I think you said, in the city. That's, um, that's incredible. Um, so we are now going to hear from Michael Schramm. Uh, Michael is Director of Information Technology and Research at the Cuyahoga Land Bank, where he developed the land bank property tracking system called the Pro Property Profile System. Uh, this information technology tool helps the corporation use data to make strategic acquisition decisions, as well as track property statuses uh, from acquisition to demolition and then on to disposition. So Michael, um, you can take it from here. Thank you. Thank you all for having me. Uh, my name is Mike Schramm. I'm with the Cuyahoga Land Bank. And, you know, I'm going to really talk about, uh, well, first of all, can I advance the slides? Yes, I can. Information systems for land banking. And I'm going to really divide this into, like, three parts. Really, I'm going to, uh, well, four parts. I'm going to introduce our land bank. Then I'm going to talk about a project that we're, we're totally involved in with Case Western Reserve's university's um, neighborhood stab stabilization team database, which is, you know, combining all the administrative data similar to, to what they're doing in Detroit and using that. Um, uh, to make to make decisions, I'm going to talk about our property profile system, which is what we use for our day-to-day -day tracking of all our land banking activities, and and is very uh, you know has a lot of the same features as what Detroit is using in their Salesforce system about you know automating tasks and things like that. And then I'm going to talk about um, strategically how we can use some data to make some. Uh, acquisition decisions here in the context of how tax foreclosure works in Ohio versus how tax foreclosure works in um, Michigan where you know they are sitting on one of four properties in the city uh, and it's it's you know due and you know we're, we're obviously sitting on a much smaller inventory and it's you know size of cities issues but it's also differences in how tax foreclosure works across state boundaries back on the answer questions in like 10 minutes so we have a, a, a mission to strategically acquire properties return them to productive use reduce blight increase property values support community goals improve the quality of life for residents we are a government purposed quasi-governmental nonprofit corporation. So we are actually out of government, but we were created by the county government. We are a standalone independent corporation. We actually have a, a $70 million um, um, uh, of funds that we get from collected penalty and interest on collected property taxes. Uh, we have uh, government land banking powers, but we're also in a private enterprise, so we can have a lot of, we're, we're a lot more transactable when it comes to uh, making decisions. And and Gus Frangos, who's our president, he wrote all, all of the Ohio uh, uh, County Land Utilization Corporation language, and he often speaks to the three major engines of land banking in Ohio, which is the statutory funding, which allows us to plan, budget, maintain a professional staff, the expedited tax foreclosure process process, which is uh, basically uh, in Ohio we had a judicial tax foreclosure process, but now we have an expedited administrative tax foreclosure process for vacant and abandoned properties, and then putting the government powers into a private nonprofit corporation to allow for a high level of transactional capacity. We've been open since June of 2009, and we are approaching our 6,000th parcel. Um, where and we've we've basically uh, disposed 1,700. 
we've demolished 4,000. That disposition number is wrong. I'm going to have to get back to you on that one. Um, we have uh, demolished over 4,000. We have facilitated almost 1,200 renovations, and we're currently managing or have managed $82 million in grants. And really, our land bank acts as more of a transactional land bank where we are doing property triage. We are basically bringing properties in through bank REOs, deed in lieu of foreclosure, HUD, Fannie Mae, and tax foreclosure and state forfeiture, and we're triaging them. We're visiting every single property to determine, is this a candidate for renovation? Is this a candidate for demolition? Is this a candidate for a side yard program? And really, the, the, one of the major differences uh, uh, from how we work from how some of the other land banks work is Ohio has actually had municipal passive land banks since the late 70s. So when we do our thing, if we do not have an immediate end user, the properties then transfer to our local municipal passive land banks for long-term holding and maintenance. So we're, we're very transactional. Um, so we use two data systems. One is the NeoCanDo Neighborhood Stabilization Team database as a planning tool and NST mashes together various public data sources uh, for planning and outreach and then we use our property profile system and the two systems through APIs actually talk to each other so that when we create a record in PPS when a, when a property comes to our, onto our radar, we have all that information that's in the NST that's, that's been collected over at the university. And then our information flows back into the NST. Uh, so Neighborhood Stabilization uh, Web App, it's maintained by uh, Case Western Reserve University. It is utilized by Cleveland's Community Development Corporations, our city and county government, and the land bank and other sort of nonprofit partners and government partners. And then the land bank has built specialized tools and variables on top of NST data to, um, to basically uh, bring things together. And really, the, the rationale of NST is, is all this government information exists in silos. There's got to be a better way. So let's put it all together into one sort of resource that's, that's you know, queryable, interactable, mappable, downloadable, has geographically referenced information, and it's updated weekly uh, so that, you know, um, Robert talked about how neighborhoods are always changing, blight is constantly changing, and therefore a database that's constantly updating is needed. And it's really this community-driven asset that we have core funders, but we have partners in you know, in neighborhood community development groups that are helping to drive what data goes in there, how the data is calculated, and how things are sort of put together, and contains county information, you know, from, from, from auditor, or we call it a fiscal officer, building and housing data, we're working on getting utility data from Cleveland Water, uh, foreclosure information, sheriff's information, Cuyahoga Land Bank information, various community development information, and we ha are also using the, the Semaphore U.S. Postal Service uh, data that we're, we're updating in there. And then um, uh, various, um, we actually also did a, a, um, a lo uh, uh, an entire um, Cleveland survey similar to what they did in Detroit, and actually that just went into the NST yesterday, all 160,000 parcels that um, an organization called the Thriving Communities Institute working with Loveland um, put that into, um, uh, uh, put it into the, um, did, a, the, did an entire uh, citywide survey. Um, and we're, you know, Robert talked about the fact that no one data set tells an accurate picture of, of vacancy or in the case of vacant lots. You know, your, your auditor data, which is used for calculating taxes, that only updates once a year as far as the land use code goes. And, and you know, we have more up-to-date information on demolition from building and housing and from the land bank. So that's basically, um, you know, creating a more accurate proxy for, for vacant lots or a more accurate proxy for probable vacancy looking at many sources. And the foreclosure process occurs across many offices. So you need to look at the data and figure out who has the latest record to sort of uh, come up with what we call our destabilization indicator. 
So that's the NST. The property profile system is our cloud-based application that is where all of the activities related to our land bank live. And it's a situation where our operations drove the development of the technology rather than trying to fit uh, our operations into some sort of technological cookie cutter box. Uh, we upload data or we enter data once, we upload photos once, and then they get plugged into wherever it is needed and is accessible to everyone. And we developed it. So there's web forms for data entry and tracking. All of our documents are, 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 are or most of our documents are, you know, um, doc, uh, generated dynamically, proceed orders, inspection reports, deeds, uh, you know, photos are in there, notes are in there, there are separate logins and modules for our various contractors, inspectors, and then there's data validation so that, you know, you don't, you're not tearing down a structure that's being remodeled or uh, renovating a structure that's being demolished and, you know, building in all sorts of business rules rules so certain processes that violate our, our programs and policies do not occur, uh, the ability to export, create reports. And like I said, because the, the, the local data in our case from Neo Can Do and the NST is integrated in our local geographies and target areas, when a parcel is created, we know it's in an NIP target area. Uh, we have automated scheduled data processing alerts tracking contractors, emails being dynamically or scheduled uh, uh, generated, and it's just a lot of a lot of different aspects of our operations are in there. So here's an example. On the left, you see a, 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 an, a, an entry, a web form for da data entry, and then it produces an inspection report PDF that can then be shared with the community, or demolition specifications are preloaded, can be edited, and then turn into a, a, a document. All of our property maintenance and grass cutting is automatically scheduled through the system. And, you know, right now we're actually in the world of, 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 of developing and sharing this technology with, with several other land banks that are out there. And, you know, we, we basically we want them to be successful and have the same technology that's available to us because it's so important that land banks are maintaining their inventory, knowing their inventory, and, um, you know, not making any mistakes because we want them to be accountable because, the you know, the better off all land banks are, the better off uh, things are. So now I'm going to sort of talk about a, a, a project we do because we're merging our NEO can do data with our property profile data into a tool called that we call the aggregator and really how it's used to, to recommend tax foreclosure candidates um, to our county treasurer for tax foreclosure that are suitable to come into the Cuyahoga Land Bank. And um, so all of this data we've classified into various tiers. So there's data that's in public control. There's data that's about to be in control of public. There's data that can be steered toward productive use. And then there are other vacant and blighted structures. And if you create, if you basically classify the data across all the sources into these various tiers, and then you can dynamically dissolve the boundaries, you can actually find these land aggregations that are sort of suitable for, for uh, additional resources of tax foreclosure or new nuisance abatement or something like that so that you can create redevelopable uh, spaces. And so tax foreclosure is our largest source of properties. They are done on a case-by-case -case basis. House Bill 294 is the administrative fast-track tax foreclosure for vacant and abandoned properties. And you know, right now there's more than 20,000 tax foreclosure eligible properties in the county that aren't already in foreclosure. And the county has resources to file to start 4,000 new cases per year which candidates are more are the most desirable for land banks so we you know in order to be eligible for house bill 294 tax foreclosure it first has to pass the vacancy and abandonment test so let's uh, and the other thing is is that properties that go through tax foreclosure that don't go to land banks that don't get sold in a sheriff's auction then end up in this 
estate forfeiture limbo in which court costs are not paid and our precious limited uh, tax foreclosure resources are wasted. So we want to get the biggest bang for our buck for tax foreclosures. So the first filter are those things, using those proxies for vacancy to figure out what are the vacant um, tax delinquent tax foreclosure eligible properties. Then the second filter are what are the properties that land banks don't want? And then the third filter is what are properties that land banks want? So you have things that are in various target areas, things that are in tipping point neighborhoods where there's a potential for a renovation or a resale, or if you demolish the worst house on the street, as Robert said, vacancy is contagious and if you have a tipping point neighborhood or a stable neighborhood and you have that terrible house and you tear down that terrible house or renovate that terrible house, you've made all the difference in the world for stemming the tide for that neighborhood. But the last factor is what are those tax delinquent properties that are already adjacent to publicly owned properties so that these land aggregations can grow. And that's sort of what we're doing when we are making recommendations to our county on where they should be prioritizing their tax foreclosure uh, candidates. So that's my story. I'm sticking to it. And now it's time to open up for questions. Michael, thank you. Um, I really appreciated the slide that had all of the various data sources that you were pulling from um, and pulling all of that into a central repository. I think that's certainly something that we try and do here. And I think it is a challenge that everyone faces, particularly as all of these new data sources are now um, available uh, for people to access. So we do have a lot of questions that have come in. And I think what I will do is start with one where actually multiple people ask the same question. Um, it is a question for Rob, and it is, how did you get access to the MLS? Uh, we get access to the MLS um, uh, through the uh, MLS comp uh, reports that any realtor can pull. And so you can pull. Uh, a complete record of MLS listings for a certain geography over a specified time frame. And so we typically will pull all sales or all listings in the city, you know, for 2012 or 2015, et cetera. And then through that, create sort of a longitudinal data set. Thank you. Um, there's another question that is uh, a, a a few people asked this, Zachary Romano and Brian Nagendera. Um, uh, it is for both of you. And it's basically asking, how much time and money did it take to develop uh, your platforms? Um, and what is your estimate of ongoing costs to run and maintain uh, what you have? Um, Do you want to go, uh, Robert, or should I go first? <laughs> um, either way, um, I'm happy to. Uh, I'll let you start because I think uh, you guys have done a lot more uh, development. Okay. Other okay. So, so, so basically, um, in the world of 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 Neo Candu and the NST, that's been an ongoing project that has basically been funded through philanthropy and contracts with various government agencies to keep that going. And that property data budget for gluing all of that information together and having all those resources and doing all that property data outreach and, and maintaining and adding to that platform, the universities, uh, the research center basically are, has to basically fundraise about $150,000 in a given year, plus or minus. Uh, you know, but that's all, you know, there's a lot of other sort of projects that are that are property data based there. As far as the property profile system, um, you know, we uh, we've basically been developing that and building on that uh, on and off for, since 2010. The first version was released in, in 2011. And basically, it's been, you know, a, a portion of my salary for, you know, five years and then probably another half person that we have here. Uh, and in the last year we've, uh, you know, we've basically 
started over from scratch, rewriting what we call our PPS 2.0, uh, which is a you know this product that we're going to be using, uh, and then you know the other land banks are using, and and um, you know if if you're interested in 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 licensing that, um, you know you can you can contact me uh, directly to basically get the the licensing costs and all of that. And then. Uh in Detroit, I think the story might be relatively similar. I mean, truthfully, <clears throat> the only person who would have a perfect insight into all the costs, I think, would probably be our CFO. But roughly, we had sort of uh, an initial build-out of Salesforce was about a quarter million dollars. And then subsequently, we have one uh, full-time admin and one sort of part-time support Salesforce admin. Um, as well as the sort of ongoing licensing costs. Um, but I, I think a big hurdle for us was that the data uh, in Detroit was so hard to come by and in such uh, just uh, uh, just absolutely, you know, blighted a condition uh, that it took a little, you know, a long time for us to get everything to a state where it was ready for this type of platform. And just as a as a comment or as a cheesy commercial, we're much less than that quarter of a million dollars in in our in our product. But their product does do you know I mean you know ours is the the Cadillac and theirs is the Bentley. So um, you know it's 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 order of magnitude as well for somebody who's handling a hundred thousand parcels. <laughs> uh, thank you. Uh, our next question is from Shantanu Singh, and it is a question for Rob. For Motor City Mapping, how many people did you need for the survey project? We heard it was in the hundreds. Sure. Well, um, uh, given the sort of time frame set out by the Blight Task Force, the Motor City Mapping survey was had a very short window. Uh, in total, they did it in about five and a half, six weeks. Um, and so they used 150 surveyors. Um, that said, you know, uh, there were sort of previous iterations of motor city mapping, which used a much smaller staff just for a longer time frame. Great. The next question is for both of you. And um, Mike, if you want to go first on this, and, and then Rob, that's great. It's from Shoshana Akins. And the question is, Philadelphia recently instituted a land bank, but because of councilmanic prerogative, council persons need to approve all actions in their area, there has been little action and little faith in advancement. Have, have either of you run across these types of political issues, and what are, what are some lessons learned? You know, I mean, in order to be effective, a, a land bank needs to basically make its own decisions and know its inventory and have professionals working for it so that it, the various people know that that you know the 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 inspections that we're doing, the decisions that we're making are the right decisions. And having those pictures and that inspection data, you know that's readily accessible through through our through our property profile system that lets us know everything we've done to that property somebody will say why are you tearing that down it's a beautiful brick structure and then all of a sudden you know you show data and pictures that says yes but that's you know all the other houses on that street are are boarded and you look inside in the pictures, the basement is all moldy and there's, you know, three feet of water in the basement. And then if you look at from the back, there's a hole in the roof. You know, if it, it basically by being professionals, by having our data all lined up, it has instilled a level of, of, of trust and confidence into our various stakeholders. And, you know, there are people who, who, who think there are things that we, 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 we demolish that we shouldn't. But at the same time, if we can bring data to that conversation and show that, you know, we're the experts, we know what we're doing, that allows us to, to, to maintain that sort of public confidence. Yeah, I guess I'd really echo 
all of Mike's comments. I, I think really uh, transparency and sort of openness and a, a sort of um, creating a, a large stream of maps and reports for all of our sort of our political folks has really helped instill, I think, a good level of confidence in our work. I think also that since the scale of our operations is really much larger than Detroit has ever seen before, um, it, it, I think most sort of politicos are pretty uh, excited just to, um, you know, I'll see the progress. You know, we're demolishing, you know, several fold more houses each year than our sort of historic averages. We're selling ten times more side lots each year than the city did historically, and we're you know, uh, cleaning up vacant properties, uh, we, you know, uh, 10 or 20 fold faster than historically mm -hmm. as well. And our, our partners, because our data is slowing back into NST um, and, and all of our, you know, council people have access to that and all of our community development corporations have access to it, they're basically knowing things that are going to get posted on our website, you know, three to six weeks before they get posted on our website as far as, you know, the disposition for a property or a, if a property is coming to us. So it's, it is that transparency um, that really helps out. And our next question is from Carter Wang. And the question is, the use of technology in this field has got to be light years ahead of where it was a few years ago. How do you guys see this moving forward? Are there technologies that you see being used in this space in the next few years that you guys aren't using now? Carter, you should be asking the Detroit guy about his prediction model because Carter works for me, works at the <laughs> Poverty Center at Case. So unless there's multiple Carter Wangs out there, but I, I figured that was going to be Carter's question. Um, uh, you know, I think it's it's a uh, I'm going to put on my his history hat here, and um, you know, you think about unfortunately, so many technological revolutions came out of World War II, for example. I don't know. I've watched the History Channel, and you know, there has never been anything like the blight being caused that you know that as part of you know the Great Recession of the late 2000s, and I think the technology had to basically be there and developed and, and you know the resources got put into Detroit and the resources are getting put into Cleveland in you know in, in terms of tens of millions of dollars for for demolition and you know I think scale brings um, evolution. I don't know if I'm getting too ph philosophical here. nobody's laughing because nobody I can't see the audience members but <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, okay, um, Rob, do you want to comment on that? I, I think the very sort of uh, similarly, I, I'm not sure if I'm really the best person to talk to since I feel like Detroit has been playing such a game of catch up the last few years. I mean, uh, three years ago, all of Detroit's public ownership and demolition and everything else was done on sort of a uh, error-filled Excel spreadsheets sitting on, you know, old computers. And so we've come a long way, but I still feel like we have longer to go. I think long-term, at least locally, the future is going to uh, sort of, I think I think the future will really sort of center around a predictive analytics. I think ultimately we're finding that that's really the only way to sort of get out front of these issues. Thank you. Uh, our next question is from Yvette Holmes, and the question is, are properties preserved for affordable housing or for those of just certain income levels? And I think perhaps it's a question for both of you. Uh, um, I guess uh, in Detroit, we definitely uh, work with a lot of partners to sort of help spur affordable housing development. Um, we one of our largest sort of disposition programs is uh, to our nonprofit partner program by which we sell a great deal of homes to CDCs um, and other sort of semi-public agencies to to do affordable ho housing development. We don't 
do any ourselves, but we also really don't do housing development. We really focus on selling property to other agencies. And you know, in a similar way, we are working with a lot of nonprofit community development groups, the Cleveland Housing Network, Habitat for Humanity, who are sort of in the affordable housing space. But at the same time, one of our most successful renovation program is called our deed and escrow program, in which you know we do sell houses. Uh, they do have our renovation specifications. They're sold at highly incentivized prices, and we supervise the renovation by private individuals who are either going to be owner occupants or investors. The deed stays in escrow while the improvements are are made. We inspect every 30 days to make sure our spec is is being you know the house is being brought up to our spec. And at the same time, it's really a sort of a sweat equity model in some ways because a lot of the people are doing the work themselves and, um, you know, it may be a $30,000 renovation for, a, for if you were paying contractor prices, but, you know, people are getting them done much cheaper, still pulling permits, still getting certificates of occupancy, and, you know, we're checking on them you know, it's a it's a you know a four month process where we're inspecting every thirty days, and you know it it you know it it builds equity. Um, we have a, a program that offers discounts to recent college graduates and to vet, vet uh, veterans, and um, you know so those are other ways to sort of build equity. Thank you. Um, we have a couple of questions from Amanda Wilson and. Uh, she is in Kansas City, where they're also developing a data dashboard, and she was wondering um, how extensively the tools uh, that you've described today are used by community members or uh, people outside of your organizations. So, you know, there is a public version of, of NeoCandu that's out there for general community members. Uh, NST is more of community partners, but a lot of the active CDCs that have block clubs are sharing a lot of that NeoCandu NST data with, um, you know, block club leaders and things like that and sort of, uh, you know, in, a, in sort of a grassrootsy way if the community development group does have an active uh, organizing outreach arm um, you know our once a property comes into our inventory and the the decisions as far as which which direction it's going is made you know it gets posted to our website um, from the land bank side um, and so you know we are putting data out there and it is being used at various community levels I think um our Salesforce itself uh, is not yet a fully public-facing um, platform, although that's certainly coming. We rely more on the city's open data portal to do a lot of our dashboards and sort of summary reporting, all of which is free. Um, of course, the city also has a weekly dashboard it sends to residents or anyone who signs up for it that's sort of automatically fed by Salesforce. As far as the sort of analysis, that's most of what I was working on, or most of what I was showing. Um, we use sort of a mixture of um, uh, open source and, uh, you know, uh, fee-for-service uh, software packages, uh, namely ArcGIS, but also QGIS. We use R, Minitab, SQL Server, MySQL, and so. Um, I think we've sort of uh, developed a suite of software packages that are based on the sort of preferences of the individual analysts. But uh, if we were, um, you know, looking for free versions, we could certainly do all of our work with open source software. Thank you. Um, I was going to try and squeeze in a few more questions, but I see that it's now uh, we are almost uh, at the end of our hour. So everyone that uh, did type in a question, please know that we will be getting back to you with answers. Um, so I would like to thank both of our speakers very much. Um, 
I hope that everyone has found this session to be very useful. Uh, please remember that we will be, this webinar has been recorded and we will be posting it to www.policymap.com slash map chats. And we'll also be sending it out uh, by email to all of the attendees. Uh, you'll also receive a survey, which we would love to have you fill out, letting us know what you thought of this session. And if there's any topics that you'd like us to cover in 2016, we are trying to figure out the variety of topics that we'd like to introduce. Our next one, which is happening in early 2016, will be on measuring the need for quality childcare. And we will post an announcement about that uh, before the end of the year, sometime in December. And lastly, I just wanted to take a moment because again, I, I need to, my staff would kill me if I didn't do this, um, but I wanna make sure you know that um, at Policy Map, we also have a data and mapping application that while it does not contain all the kinds of very, very cool local data um, that we saw presented today, we do have some similar vacancy home sale data and trend data that may be of use to you. And if you have not trialed Policy Map, I would highly recommend going to policymap.com and checking it out. There is a fairly robust free version of the tool as well as a subscriber version. And we're obviously here for any questions or demos if you're interested. So again, I just wanted to thank you very much for your time and we will get back to you with answers to all of your questions. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Mike. Thank you. Thank you.